do the founder partners that we work with share the same vision of making a real difference to the consumers. Hello and welcome. I'm your host Pratish Sanyal and you're listening to the 1% project. Conversations that will help you understand how some of the smartest minds build, scale and operate new ideas and ventures. If you enjoy these conversations, do share and subscribe. My next guest on the 1% project is Aditi Sharma. She is the head of startup programs and investments at Grab Ventures. Aditi speaks to us about her career which spans from technology to consulting and corporate venture at Grab. She also talks about the evolution of corporate venture in Southeast Asia, super apps and how she evaluates a founder fit for the venture arm. Welcome Aditi to the 1% project. Thanks for having me Pratish. You have had an amazing career. You started off in Thapur University back in Punjab, India. Thapur is one of the leading engineering schools. Your first job was with ST Microelectronics. Then you went to study at Indian School of Business. From there, you worked at McKinsey. And now you're in Singapore heading startups and investments for Grab Ventures. How has that journey been? It's been a thoroughly exciting and a great learning experience seeing the technology sector from various parts of the value chain has been like really really exciting part of it. I started on the development side as an engineer then moved on to take a more advisory and ops transformation kind of role as a consultant and now more in the partnerships investments venture building and ecosystem enabler kind of role i think that's given a very good understanding of the dynamics of the sector itself and and a sector that is like ever evolving so yeah absolute fun what are your thoughts about corporate venture space in southeast asia versus the rest of the world i've actually only worked in uh, india and across southeast asia so i can probably make an observation on how i see the region came about to being a technology hub that makes it distinct in that sense three kinds of uh, technology hubs as we look globally first is the tech hubs like silicon valley or bangalore in india which started off as sort of startup ecosystems and the corporates went chasing in search of innovation so that is that gives them one unique character I think the second distinct ones that I see would be the ecosystems in China where you see two to three distinct ecosystems developing around BATHQ and now even ByteDance so sort of large tech ecosystem which had startups seeding around them I think Singapore and I believe Hong Kong sort of sit in a third bucket which started off as the APAC HQ of corporates and over time also became the silicon valley of the east of sorts so it's interesting how both sides of the ecosystem and the investing space were sort of developing in parallel which gives it a very unique character in terms of dynamic in terms of the maturity of the ecosystem and also the pace of the tech development it's unique in that sense the corporate venturing the space in southeast asia and how the corporates and the startups interact with each other what were the initial hypothesis grab ventures started off what kind of frameworks what are, were your initial thoughts that you wanted to achieve and how did you go about it the mandate always has been focusing on the next sort of disruptive businesses for grab the framework and the thinking on what that could be has been sort of a uh, constant all along depending on essentially two things both of which are actually very very customer focused the first being where is the opportunity meaning where do we see customers that are unserved or underserved by the current alternatives in the market so first part is the opportunity from a customer lens the second part is where do we believe as a platform we have a reason to play and the ability to serve these unmet needs so this would be areas where there's some sort of adjacencies to the core assets and capabilities that we have as a pro- platform so i think those two customer angle sort of drive the decision on where we 
choose to play as a ventures team i think that has actually led you to focus on grab fresh grab wheels and grab kitchen but the post covid situation may slightly change do you see any of these pushing off faster or do you think a new business unit may emerge because of the post covid learnings post covid sort of there are two key themes that uh, we're seeing emerge in the ecosystem i think one it was definitely coming up into 2019 already but the pace is just much more accelerated which is around creating more sustainable businesses so there's a lot more focus in the post covid world on that which is a great thing especially coming in from an investing standpoint i think the second is as you were mentioning pradesh there's some sectors that have just sort of moved in terms of demand they've helped accelerate the the change in consumer behavior especially sectors like groceries sectors like remote working at tech the covid pandemic and the situation uh, has created a lot of opportunities and shifted up the demand curve to a higher base from where these opportunities can grow we definitely see some of the sectors that you were mentioning moving much faster and some very new interesting opportunities merge as a lot of users are spending more and more time online working remotely the three business units that you have within ventures how do they interact with the startups because now you're in batch 3 and your first batch had a startup called book my show which started in 1999 which has millions of users in india and southeast asia and you have younger startups which started in 2015 2016 so how do you mentor them work with them because there are two different levels of their growth paths Mm, that's a good question pradesh it's quite a diverse spectrum of startups that we work with and how essentially that works is even though we ourselves are a rather small team of startup advocates venture builders but thankfully we have a much larger ecosystem of internal and external experts to bank on so for example when we are doing for the grab ventures velocity when we are doing any workshops on the functional topics like growth hacking or anything around user acquisition we have a large base of internal experts people who actually help build the platform in the early days we can bank on them so that's a huge asset at the same time we also have the privilege of having the large network of friends of grab who have been kind enough to offer their time and support for the portfolio to help them grow whenever we are doing a fundraising workshop there are very experienced vcs in the region who we could always bring in who can give uh, the founders very stage specific uh, advice be it your pre seed startup to a seed and late stage having that broad ecosystem has been really helpful to support the portfolio we also hear that that's a value proposition that connects a lot to the startups that we work with as a venture team how do you assess your success we measure our success based on the two key stakeholders that we have one is definitely the founders so we measure our success by the success of the founders that we support so that is the key metric the startups that we are working with how they are raising the follow on funding how well their base of users is growing how their product is coming along that's one key metric the success of our founders the second one definitely is the value that we are creating for grab in terms of growth in terms of solving the the user needs better so those would be the two areas how we continue to monitor how well we are delivering to the original mission of creating new disruptive businesses uh, or tapping new opportunities for grab who is your perfect founder yeah i think as you mentioned the stage of founders that we work with is actually very diverse we're working with pre-seed founders all the way to growth and late stages but stage independent i think there's a key common denominator of similarity in vision and culture with grab what that really comes down to is do the founder partners that we work with share the same vision of making a real difference to the consumers so very cons- uh, customer centric lens if you ask folks at grab it's actually very common to have emails or sharing from anthony at town halls 
around what he's hearing from customers. He spends a lot of time with customers and you keep hearing a lot about it, what he's hearing. There's a very, very strong element of customer centricity. That's something we seek out in the founders that we work with very closely. When I started off, this like a very fuzzy thing to measure. But I think over time, I've seen that this starts very clearly reflecting in how founders would think about their products, how they would think about their business strategy and how even they would think about their partnerships. So I think that core customer centricity vision is a key or to what a perfect founder for a Grab Ventures portfolio looks like. The market that Grab as well as the venture team operates in Southeast Asia is a huge opportunity. And at the same time, it's a heterogeneous market. Every market has its own culture, nuances, languages, upbringings, and consumer habits. How do you see somebody entering a certain market and emerging as a regional leader? I think there are two elements or two levels to to the opportunity. I think British one part is establishing yourself in a core market there our learning has been being hyper local is key as you mentioned each of the markets even within each country the user needs are so diverse you can have very long conversations when you meet folks in indonesia about how east java west java is different and how java is different from all the other islands being hyper local is really the key how can you localize your solutions to the need of each market win the heart of customers, really deliver customer delight. The second level of it comes to when you talk about regional player, one element is how do you still create a very strong foundation, a very scalable platform that scales well across geographies, be it in terms of the core platform, the architecture itself. How can you build something that really scales quickly? How product being very localized. On the second part, I also think there is there is a strong business case to, to taking support of larger platforms, platforms like Trap and other platforms in terms of really scaling quickly across the markets in the region. So I would think that those two those two areas can really help startups, one being hyper local, but at the same time having good strategic partner base to grow. That actually leads me to a more interesting question, which is super apps. Once you become a regional player, how do you really focus on being a super app and will Southeast Asia have multiple super app players? You you asking me to be the wizard? I think, yeah, definitely, potentially, as yes, as you mentioned, the market is really big. The market is really complex. It's a huge opportunity in that sense. We definitely see already and see the opportunities for multiple players to come to service various opportunities. How? I think, again, comes down to being hyper-local yeah. and still have a very strong regional foundation. That also links to our own approach. Long back, we came to realize this is so complex, we can't do everything on our own. And that is why we've taken a very partner-centric approach where we are like, hey, this is the core. And who are sort of the partners we can bring around it to create something very exciting for the users. And that's how we work with the founders in GVV and some of the other programs we do. If I have to look at industries on which super apps should focus, do you think fintech is the biggest opportunity or there are other industries that super apps would need to focus on? I think fintech is definitely a huge opportunity. And that also would link to a lot of startups. Look at the number of startups coming up in the region. There is a lot of fintech startups. And within fintech itself, you see many different opportunities, payments, lending, wealth, etc. Given the ecosystem, given how big the base of unbanked and underbanked populations, financial services and fintech is a huge opportunity. But I would think that from a super app angle, that would be big, but not the only opportunity. We see, I mean, Southeast Asia loves food. Yeah, It's the common binding force. So you see a lot of interesting stuff evolving around food. Complexity of the region makes logistics a huge opportunity. And mm. you see a lot of ecosystem developing around that opportunity space. There are a lot of core pillars around which uh, you are seeing and you will see 
uh, super app ecosystems evolve. You talked about food and recently Grubhub was acquired. Do you see consolidation in this market as we go forward? Yeah, but I think the good thing that you see with the COVID scenarios, that there's a lot of steam that has gathered around the food market and mm. you see a lot of interesting opportunities come around it. Food, just centering around food delivery is not the case anymore. I think there are a lot of sizable use cases that are coming around food delivery so prepared food delivery is one space takeout has accelerated as a use case in the market semi-prepared meals is coming out as an interesting opportunity there might be some consolidation but you also see large opportunity spaces coming around which you could see newer and newer players and verticals kind of emerge so among all the countries or regions in southeast asia which one are you following closely and you find a lot of promise in? It's like asking a parent to pick <laughs> the favorite kid. <laughs> yeah, I think as we were also discussing earlier, different markets in the region are at a different phase. I think it's how big the population is, more simplistic way of looking at it. I wouldn't see one opportunity as bigger than the other. It's just very, mm -hmm. very different. And each of the markets, given the maturity of the ecosystem, are at a different point in the S curve. I think for purely from a numbers perspective, it's a smaller market, but really sophisticated, more mature. You've seen Indonesia go around on the curve. You've seen Vietnam. There's an interesting opportunity in, in Philippines and Thailand. And then there is a whole new area of frontier markets. So everyone is at a different phase. And also it will be interesting to see how does the overall regional dynamics sort of evolve post-COVID scenario as well. Definitely the next year is a great, uh, great time to watch yeah. out. Southeast Asian startups have really ticked off all boxes, grown and done well. But I haven't seen Southeast Asian startups going global. Two thoughts there. One, I definitely see several examples in the B2B tech space of Southeast Asian startups that are that were set up here, homegrown, and have gone on to service much wider base of market globally, for example, in US, Europe, et cetera. There are examples. Whether you'll see less or more in the future, I would also think is driven is is more of a strategic choice that the startup founders here are making. As we were discussing, the market in Southeast Asia, it's called Southeast Asia, but it's just many, many complex markets all rolled together, 600 million plus population. It's even more of a strategic choice where the founders are looking at focusing on one core market, excelling in that and growing in the region around it, or picking up to see place where startups have been founded in Singapore, they've gone to similar North, East, North Asian markets, they've gone to Australia. So it's more a strategic choice. A quick fire round. I'm going to ask you questions and you need to give me a one word or one sentence. Whatever first comes to your mind. Sure, let's do it. A favorite book or blog? As you can see, I'm cited by podcasts right now. The knowledge is definitely something I am listening to a lot these days. Idea or a team? Team. Hardest thing about your job? <laughs> I think uh, productizing what's the best available inside and bringing it to a very big variety of founders out there one thing that you would have loved to know before you started off pace yourself <laughs> i think yeah not look forward to retiring at 40 but more all about purpose and creating value for as long as actually you can the last one gut or data interesting data <laughs> otherwise okay. you would doubt if i'm a Pretty consultant good. or not <laughs> i won't thank you thanks pritish you can find the show notes for this episode and every other episode on one percent live if you enjoy this conversation share it on social media and leave a review see you next time